All right, we're going to get started here. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Zach Jones from Vertical Measures, and I'm here hosting VM's monthly webinar series. Today's webinar is titled, Make Email Great Again, with an actual plan on how to do that, and will be presented by Michael Barber. Uh, Michael Barber is the founder of Barber & Hewitt. His work has been featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and Forbes. This work has been awarded numerous industry awards, but more importantly has driven successes including the most effective and cost efficient campaign in the history of a Fortune 500 company and 160 times return on ad spend. 50 million earned media impressions within the first month of a new product launch and had his hands on somewhere around a quarter billion emails in his career. Additionally, he has a 100% success rate with the couples he has married as an ordained minister. <laughs> that is a lot, Michael. <laughs> uh, but before we get started and I hand it over to you, uh, I just have a few housekeeping notes I'd like to bring up. Uh, today's webinar will be available for viewing uh, by tomorrow and we'll send out an email with a link so you can watch it and review the slides. Uh, we'll also be happy to answer any questions. So if you take a peek at your webinar interface, you'll see a questions tab where you can ask or you can send anything you'd like me to ask Michael afterwards. And also, uh, you can ask question, questions via Twitter using the hashtag VMWebinar. Uh, if you're having any technical difficulties throughout this webinar, uh, please just attempt to uh, sign off and then reconnect, and it should work. So without further ado, I think I'm going to hand it off to Michael, our presenter. Hi, guys. I'm Zach. Thank you so much for that welcome appreciate the warm welcome from the vertical um, the vertical team and uh, welcome everybody that's joining us today for make email great again with an actual plan on how to do it as Zach mentioned my name is Michael Barber you can reach me at, at Michael J Barber pretty much anywhere um, online if you've got questions or you're going to participate uh, in the Twitter stream and we've got carved out some time for those questions um, at the end of the session so let's dive right in um, I'm a big fan of why if you are a fan of Simon Sinek and his series around Start With Why, I am too. So why are you all sitting here for the next uh, hour or so chatting about email? Well, 4.1 billion email accounts across the globe and growing. If you are a numbers person, then you can easily add up Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, multiply that times two, and you still don't get to this number. This is still a huge group of people. Almost 92% of people who are connected online have an email address. In the US, that's about 296 million people that have at least one email address. So this is a huge saturation um, that we have from a marketplace perspective. The other thing is no matter where you look, um, what data source and all the data sources that you're going to see over the next hour um, come from very recent either data or research papers that have been published between the last 12 to 18 months. So it's all very recent. I'll note that if it's global or US based as we go through. But no matter where we look uh, from a research perspective, email continues to deliver one of the highest ROIs for marketers. This data comes from VentureBeat, which looked at about 3,300 global marketers comparatively to the other channels that you see here from TV to video to affiliate. Regardless of industry, we know that to be the case too. This data comes from GetResponse. It was published last year. Regardless of where we looked in terms of affiliate network, health and wellness, marketing service provider, publishing, media, travel and transportation, email continues to deliver on the vast majority of these industries good and or excellent ROI comparatively against other channels. Continuing on that trend, eConsultancy published this late last year. They asked marketers, I believe this was a global data set of about 2,000 marketers, how do you rate the following channels in terms of return on investment? And you can see here that email dominates the vast majority of direct both offline and online channels here. It also beats social from a 40 to 1 perspective. This data comes from Campaign Monitor. You know, we've largely been focused on social for the past five years and particularly very keenly aware that it's largely transitioning um, away from a customer acquisition tool into a more customer uh, service and monitoring tool than it is uh, from an acquisition perspective. Email continues to be social in this regard. What I also think is really interesting is we've kind of taken our ability to, uh, you know, to market to consumers from an email address perspective well outside of the inbox. So for lack of a better way of describing this, you know, 10 years ago, once you had that opt-in email subscriber, that one-to-one -one communication that you could have with them was really only inside of their inbox. But we can now take that data that's at our disposal, that email address, regardless if they are opt-in or opt-out, 
and begin to target those users well outside the inbox using things like Facebook custom audiences, Google, Google or Gmail customer match to actually really generate rich customer interactions and customer journeys um, at different touch points or different channels that that customer may be in. So we can take that email address loaded into Facebook or loaded into really any of the major display ad networks or ad networks for that matter and target users based on the behaviors that they interact with us or they engage with us inside of their inbox. So we can send them, we can direct an ad towards them or target them if they open or if they click or if they opened and clicked but didn't buy. Um, some really great data for these types of activities came out of Salesforce Marketing Cloud late last year around the propensity of email openers who saw ads um, that they were more likely to purchase, specifically when brands reached an open, when they reached a consumer that had opened a campaign um, within Facebook, that consumer was 22% more likely to actually purchase comparatively if they only saw the ads or they only e emailed or they only opened the email. So more than ever, we have the ability to target users at in, within different channels by just having their email address. The value of that email address extends well outside of the inbox. And if you're a marketer like me who cares about generating long-term customer revenue from long-term revenue and value from our customers, um, then email can be a really great path to generating uh, positive increasing uh, revenue from customers over the course of anywhere from three to four years. Um, we know that based on data that we're seeing, when we have a subscriber as a part of our, uh, our customer database, they typically continue to spend money and increase their revenue spend with us uh, almost all the way through year three as this data from Salesforce Marketing Cloud uh, shows us. And because of all of those data sets, we're starting to see this trend where email budgets are opening up. You know, three or four years ago, we were having conversations with clients um, that would not start with, are we actually going to increase our budget around email? They would simply be, we're keeping email's budget line item the same. And because we're seeing these changes or these, these increased ROI from email, as well as just a bit of a renaissance from how engaged people are inside of their inbox, you're starting to see budgets open up. So last year, GetResponse asked about, I want to say, 1,500, 1,550 marketers, what are you doing with your email budget? 57% uh, of them said they are increasing that particular budget. Additionally, we're seeing this in other data sources as well. eMarketer, just this past January, published this data. They asked retail marketers worldwide if they expected to increase their budget in specific channels. Lo and behold, the email channel is the one where they expect to do that budget increase. These are things we haven't seen in a long, long time. And that data continues to be seen in other places. This data comes from email on ACID. They asked about, I want to say somewhere in the neighborhood of like 1,500-ish uh, marketers, are you going to spend more time and more dollars with this particular channel? 71.8% said more time, so resources and human capital. 86% said that they would spend more money. And where are those dollars going for those new or larger budgets, if you will? Well, they're going to places like technology and tools because we've got really robust platforms that touch email these days. You've seen all the major, uh, if you will, digital marketing platforms or suites kind of gobble up email providers as well as other providers uh, over the last few years. So we've got really robust and mature tools at our disposal. List growth, we know that when we have an opt-in subscriber, the value that that gives us is tremendous, well beyond the the inbox these days. So people are investing in how do we generate more subscribers. And because the context of how people are interacting with our campaigns, transitioning away from a largely desktop environment into one that's largely dominated by the devices that we hold in our hands, you're seeing brands invest in development and design because we have a diff we have to be able to serve our emails in a, a vast majority of different contexts, devices, and apps than we ever have done before. But then the question often becomes is, are we actually spending enough in this channel? You know, this channel's been around a long time and we've kept the budgets the same. I thought this data from eConsultancy last year was really interesting to look at. They actually charted the average proportion of total marketing budgets that email accounts for versus the average proportion of sales that's attributed to the same channel, to email. And you can see that there's a distinct gap between these two lines, meaning do we have an opportunity to fill this gap and potentially spend more to gain more dollars that are actually being attributed to that channel. That's something we've definitely got to think about as we go about doing our budgeting around these tactics. Then the question often is, is, is this going to continue, right? Are marketers going to continue to love this channel? And what we know based on data that we've seen from Litmus last year is that when we asked uh, about 2,400 
visitors to Litmus's blog, which are usually uh, email marketers uh, anywhere from enterprise level to mom and pop level. In the year 2020, will you continue? Do you believe that email marketing's return on investment will be higher or lower than it is now? The vast majority of those respondents said it would be higher. Um, and that's only half the equation, right? So if we believe as marketers um, that email is going to continue to deliver ROI, the other thing is that we've got to make sure consumers really like this channel because as marketers, we have to go fish where the fish are and predict where those fish are hopefully going. Um, and Litmus also did ask about 3,300 consumers, I believe was the total number. This was a global data set. Which particular channels, which particular channels where you actually get advertising in, do you believe will still exist in 10 years? And lo and behold, when they, when those users, those people were able to select which particular channels mattered, you know, and would be around in 10 years, email was the one that they more often than not checked. And you can see Facebook, cable TV, and then sort of down the line to Twitter, Snapchat, Postal Mail, and sort of the, stal the stalwart of uh, direct response mechanisms, uh, the landline phone um, at the bottom of that chart right there. But consumers continue to dig this channel. Regardless of where we look, this data source comes from Marketing Sherpa. Um, it's largely for European-based uh, uh, consumers, um, but a few U.S. and a few, uh, few Canadians, and I believe a few Aussies tossed into this data set as well. Um, but they asked specifically, which particular channel do you like to receive branded communications in? Lo and behold, email, that one that's sitting there right above 70%, followed by all sort of the other major uh, offline and online tactics that we utilize as marketers. And then the question often is, okay, well, that's great for the demographics of today, but what about the consumers of tomorrow? And Litmus also broke down that data in terms of the percentage of consumers by age who think that email will still be around in 10 years. And even the younger, pains me to say this, millennials, and the younger ends of the spectrum, which are people that are significantly longer than I am at this point, continue to believe this channel is going to be around for a number of years to come. So we've got sort of this trending uh, this trending idea that not only do marketers believe that this is a channel that is robust, the data that comes out of it from an ROI perspective tends to tell us that yes, this is a place where we should be spending time, and also from a demographic perspective, regardless of where we look across ages, consumers believe that this trend is going to continue. But the shift that's happening over the last few years has been a different context in where people actually read those emails. And it's largely driven in a mobile first context, or at least the devices that we can have in our hands, whether that's a smartphone or a tablet. Um, Litmus does a really good job of tracking this particular data. They touch multiple millions, if not billions of emails a month um, with their tracking pixel. And they've been tracking this for the last few years. And you can see since September 2015, we've really sort of jumped up above that 50% that threshold in terms of where people actually open campaigns for the first time. And this doesn't matter if that we're not, this is global uh, across the board, different brands. So we're talking about a selection of both B2B and B2C consumers. But what we know based on this data, as well as uh, data from agencies of past that I've been lucky to enough to be a member of their teams, as well as our own organization, is regardless of where we look, the first touch often is a mobile touch with a smartphone or a tablet. When people actually convert, often that becomes very different. On the B2B side, that conversion mechanism, often that conversion action often happens on a desktop. For B2C, it often happens, uh, more often than not happens, uh, right within whatever device that consumer has in their hands at any given moment. But we know regardless of whether we're looking at B2B or B2C uh, opportunities or brands, if you will, that the vast majority of first-time opens are happening within mobile. How that breaks down is in the data set that you see. And if you're ever interested in how this breaks down, Litmus publishes this every single month and updates these graphics. But you can see how the breakdown works out in terms of uh, Apple being sort of the dominant provider of where people are opening email campaigns, followed by the Gmail app that crosses both iOS and Android. And then you can see all the way down through uh, the top 10. Of course, Number six and number seven, Outlook and Outlook.com are the two that really bother us email marketers because we have to do some tricky things to try and make sure that things look good in Outlook, right? Those are still the, the behemoths of, especially for the B2B marketers in the room having to design emails that work in those platforms. But we can continue to see a good amount of first time opens that are happening even with those uh, older platforms too. And because we're not connected to you know, our best list when we're reading emails in a variety of different places, we are reading emails at very odd places than we ever have done before. I love this data that comes from Adobe. They've published it two years in a row now. It's their consumer email 
uh, trending benchmark report comes out December of every year and they're going to continue to do it. But for the last year, they've been asking, where do you read email? Where do you interact with your inbox? And you can see some of these stats are so crazy weird. Watching TV and movie, right? We're having a multi-screen experience in bed, right? The first thing we do in the morning is not turn off our alarm on our phone. Well, we do that. We stretch and grab our phones, and the first thing we do, we don't kiss our spouse. We don't look, you know, we don't wake up with the kids. We don't pet the dog or the cat or whatever else that you're keeping in your bed. We grab our phones. Um, and then we get into in, way more interesting stats, like we're sitting on the having vacation, and, you know, having a beer and reading our book, and we're still connected to our inboxes. Or this is where things get really fun and interesting and potentially creepy. 45% of people self-report that they're sitting on the toilets or in the bathroom and utilizing their inbox. So you can see here, while people are on the phone, right, they're talking to their bosses, they're responding, walking, commuting, meal with others, face-to-face -face conversation, we're still uh, inside our inbox. Working out, we're on the stair stepper in, inside of our inbox. We're driving, heaven forbid, and we are in our inbox. Or at a formal ceremony, like a wedding or a bat mitzvah or a quinceanera or whatever you may be, we are connected to our inboxes so intimately and, and at rapidly different places than we have ever have been before. You know, fiber to pre, let's just say pre-iPhone, you know, sort of pseudo black, older Blackberry times, us as email strategists would tell you the best time to send an email campaign was like Tuesday and Thursday at 9 a.m. because what was everybody doing at that point? They were strapped to their desks getting through their emails and that's when people interacted with emails. Um, but now because we are largely being driven in this type of environment where we're connected all the time, there's really no perfect time of day to send. It really comes down to the individual subscriber day, at, excuse me, level, when the appropriate time that we should be connecting with them. Um, so we have to be able to leverage tools that allow us to get into that inbox when they're looking for it. What's also just really interesting to look at over the past few years is this change the media has had around the idea of email. You know, two or three years ago, it was that email was going to be dead, right? Wired, Adweek, Wall Street Journal, Fast Company, it didn't matter. You saw all these things because of Slack, Asana, project management tools, Facebook Messenger, everything was, email was dead. But lo and behold, over the last two or so years, we've had a bit of an email renaissance. And whether you're looking at HBR, or Harvard Business Review, The Atlantic, The Guardian, um, and some of the articles that you find uh, you know, online on any given sort of marketing uh, thought leader's uh, blog, Regardless of where you look, you're starting to see articles like this where email is starting to get sort of this triumphant return, this renaissance, if you will, uh, around, um, around this particular channel. So we're starting to see this totally different 180 from the media that's really starting to celebrate this channel. And we're also seeing this just on an engagement perspective. With our own clients, we're seeing drastically different engagement rates than we've seen in years previously when it comes to this channel. So the question is why that's happening, and we're going to try and answer that over the next 40 or so minutes. Now you will not find, I'm very big on not having a lot of text on slides as you've noticed, but I love this quote from Adobe that came out of that same consumer email benchmark report at the end of December. It kind of sums up this idea of why we're all sitting here. Um, after going through all the data, they had this really good summation at the end where they said, email is still the number one most effective one-to-one -one communication channel for marketers, even though there is more noise in all of our inbox and despite Everything we're sending towards consumers like mobile apps, social media, text, everything, bots, messengers, power though rests in being close to the data to help determine the right email message and when to deliver it. And that becomes the real key of what we're trying to do here. How do we take what we've already been doing fairly well and make it better and we're gonna help you through that. But we got a lot of problems. And with all due respect, we are largely causing a lot of those issues. First of which is we're sending a lot of email that we shouldn't be. Almost 80% of email is spam. It doesn't qualify as us actually getting an opt-in to receive it. That equates to about 94 billion spam messages per day. And if you think that doesn't have a dramatic impact on the economy, you'd be wrong. We're spending in the neighborhood of about $20 billion a year, according to a Stanford and Harvard researcher, on trying to combat this issue. And if you're looking for really the time where this becomes really tried and true for anybody, regardless of if you're a marketer or not, to really see just how bad spam can get, it's that holiday period, right? It's that Black Friday to Cyber Monday period and through Christmas, where email marketers really, regardless if it's B2B or B2C, really ramp up because apparently when we're sitting and eating turkey or we're sitting on an opening presence, that's the time when we should be sending email campaigns. Return Path looked at the propensity of email that happens at certain periods of the year. And what they found in 2015 and 2016 is that regardless of brands, most of us are ramping up our email campaigns as we get towards the end of the year. 
Now that could be fiscal things, trying to drive sales, but what we know is this, for all that ramping that we do, for all that additional email volume that we deliver, what, what they found was the fact, what Return Path found was that almost all of that email was largely ignored. It was never opened, it was never interacted with, it was never clicked on. So for all of that additional email volume, it largely got ignored. And it's no surprise because of examples that I'm gonna show you, right? This first one is the one I call the mm, subject line or where do I click? Right, if we live in this idea that, if we live in this, uh, in this environment that's dominated from a mobile perspective, you've got essentially what is like 185 characters in that subject line. They've not even front loaded what's most particular to them. And when you look down into the email, you've probably got, what, a good eight or nine calls to action. There's just no direct way that someone's gonna be able to understand what you want to do there. Never mind the fat fingers that are gonna have to click on 14 different calls to action because this isn't designed appropriately. This example is called the you just used half the screen, it comes from our friends at Hallmark. So what Hallmark's done here is the whole point of this particular email campaign, as you see in the subject line, is watch Have a Little Faith on the Hallmark channel. But yet you actually don't get a call to action on Have a Little Faith until the last sort of quarter of the first the above the fold content. We've got all this jumbo mumbo around view from mobile, view as a web page that consumers don't care about. Please add Hallmark. No, I'm not going to add you then this banner that has nothing to do with it, and I can't even read it because it's, the text is too small, and then you get to Lawrence Fishburne and Bradley Whitford hugging it out around having a little faith, right? What we actually should care about because this is what Hallmark wants us to. We've got to get to the point, especially when consumers are on the go or sitting on the toilet or dealing with their kids in the morning and they're sitting in their inboxes. Or a total hierarchy mess, right? Gone are the days where we can have multi-column layouts within emails because no one pinches and zooms um, with an email campaign. Or examples like this, sharing, or in this case, testing is caring. You can see in the subject line on the left-hand side, we read Robin, hashtag global.firstname, hashtag, hashtag, because of that extra hashtag, you've got delivered now to millions of subscribers, that particular uh, that particular word, series of words and, and characters versus their actual first name. And our good friends uh, at Marketing Profs, um, if you look at the actual salutation in the middle of the email, hey there, percentage, percentage member, underscore name, and so on and so forth. Because of the additional percentages, the actual name wasn't dropped in there. So we've got to get accustomed to actually taking care and testing our campaigns, especially when we're doing data integrations like this. This is the example of emails everywhere we don't care. I see brands all the time when I've opted into a particular product or a particular service, suddenly feel like that they can opt me into all of their campaigns. For the sake of example, this is Barry's Bootcamp, which is a group fitness class that has about 20 or so locations across the globe, and I've gone to a couple of those locations. But a few weeks ago, I got an email from their Swedish loca Sweden-based location um, in Amengansett, and I was like, why did I get an email from Sweden? Because one, I don't understand the language, and two, I've never been to that studio, and when I clicked on my preferences center, I was opted into every single one of their studios versus being just opted into just those studios that I have attended. Um, and so this is an important point because you could have hundreds, if not thousands of SKUs, um, depending upon what type of organization you are. And just because one person has opted in for information on one SKU doesn't mean that they want information on all those other products or services or product launches that you may be doing. For this example, I called it the Just Stop Sending Me Email. This is a preferences center that Ann Hanley at Marketing Prof sent me a few weeks ago. And if you look at this, I've zoomed it up for you. Now, you put yourself in the shoes of a consumer. You're pissed off, you've definitely clicked on the subscription center because you're not happy and you've clicked on subscribe. And this is what you're presented with. Please select one of these options to update your, your subscription. The first one is keep me subscribed to the following selected list. And the option is new list. This person has not even taken the time to actually tell you what list that you're a part of. The next option is unsubscribe me from all my current email lists. So I'm like, oh, there's current ones? Is there old ones too? No, I'm not gonna touch that. But the last option is never email me again. Most people will click on never email me again because you've made that so sim super simple of a statement. So we've got to get used to having better preference centers and not presenting new lists or undefined variables that consumers don't understand. I call this example the out of the blue WTF. This is the TSA uh, email, TSA email that I received a few weeks ago. I had been um, utilizing TSA PreCheck for basically three years at this point, and then got this email from them that said, three simple steps to receive TSA PreCheck expedited screening, get, use, go. Well, I've already been using it, I've already had it, 
But this happens all the day, all the time where we launch new products or new opportunities, and we don't take the time to segment our list and understand maybe who would be the right people to deliver that content to versus blanketing our entire uh, campaign. Or the good old nothingness, right? And we've all had this happen if you've been doing email for any significant amount of time or not. Either the images didn't get loaded or uh, somebody forgot to code the email incorrectly and we suddenly get all the images lost in this. Or this example, subject line, hashtag, say all right. So if you look at the subject line, it's a little grainy because I had to zoom this one out. It's a little bit of an older example. This subject line says, marketing list. It is no wonder that people don't feel so loving when they get things like marketing lists in the subject line. Or URL craziness. There's been a trend over the last two or three years of sending more text-based emails, and I think that's a really great trend to tap into. But often you'll see things like this where someone is sending a tracking URL that's like 2,000 characters long. Listen, people fall into two different buckets when it comes to privacy online. Either they we're giving away everything and we love social sign-on and we give everything to Facebook and we don't care as long as we've got money in the bank and we can pay our bills, or you've got the other sort of other set of people that care about privacy that don't still do their, don't do any banking online, they don't do anything from social sign-on, they don't give away, they don't have a Facebook profile, right? The 50% of people that are of that boat are thinking that you're sending them to sub-Saharan Africa to actually take away their entire life savings when you utilize a tracking link that looks like this. So we've, if we're going to be doing text-based campaigns, we've got to make sure that we're actually uh, utilizing a URL that feels a little bit more appropriate. Or this example of pretending, this comes from, um, I attended the B2B marketing forum last year at Marketing Props, actually spoke there. Um, and this particular example, I got an email almost three and a half months after the forum from a salesperson who wanted to tell me that he would really like to have, to have connected at the B2B Marketing Props forum, but he didn't have the chance. It turned out he actually wasn't there. But this happens all the time where people try and pretend, particularly from a B2B perspective of that we met or that you were at this show, because we've utilized data from social sources or other places or attendee lists or sponsorship lists that we've, we've thrown into our subscriber list to try and target people with just to pretend like we are actually can make an offer, off, offer opportunity uh, to our contacts that would be actually specific for them to want to actually interact with us. So we've got to get accustomed to not pretending and telling people the truth or at least connect with them in more authentic ways. I call this example the what the what from our friends at Omni Hotels. If you look at the subject line, it says hashtag because you know everything needs a hashtag these days. Hashtag at the Omni 17 guest, guest glimpses that'll have you packing. And lo and behold, there is not 17 guest glimpses, there's only one. Or this example from Brick, which is an event space, um, and Brick is making you pinch and zoom. Anytime you make people pinch and zoom, we're making them do too much work. There are only two things that people will do on their smartphones from a pinch and zoom perspective. You're probably all thinking about them now. We zoom in on images and we will pinch and zoom on maps. If we make people work hard for our content, they are going to either delete it, move on, go to a different competitor, or heaven forbid report and mark as spam because they don't like the fact that this crappy email is ending up in their inboxes. Or this, right? The can you read this example from Alaska Airlines where the font is so small that I can't even read it. And there are 48 calls to action in 40 pixels here. How my poor little thumbs and fingers can navigate through this, uh, I, I don't know. We've just got to get better than this. Or it gets even worse. This is a registration confirmation from uh, the Disney, run Disney, excuse me, for the superheroes half marathon. I can't even read this. I've just spent a couple hundred bucks to register for this marathon where I run with the heroes, and this is what you send me? I just don't understand why we make consumers work this hard. I love this example. This is the we don't want to talk to you, but we really do for a couple of different reasons. This is with a typical experience that most hotels are giving you from an inbox perspective after you check out, right? You get on the left-hand side, you see you get your folio or your receipt. Call your attention to the from name. It says, do not reply at starwoodhotels.com. And I'm like, really? I can tweet at you. I can Facebook you. I can messenger bot you. I can, heaven forbid, have to have a conversation with your customer service agents, but you can't reply to my email? I don't understand that. We also know that do not reply can also have issues with deliverability. So there's that as well. But then five minutes later, I get an email that says, thank you for staying with us. We love you. We want your feedback. We want your review on TripAdvisor and Yelp and all these different places. And I'm like, hey, just deliver this in one cohesive email campaign and just make me feel a little bit more loved for spending a couple hundred bucks at your location with something that like the from name is La Meridian instead of do not reply. So we've got to get better 
at, at those little different uh, those little different tactics and nuances of the inbox. For this one, right, the, you really don't want to unsubscribe from us. Really, really don't. My friend Ann Hanley forwards me this. And by the way, if you get any great examples of bad email campaigns, please send them my way because as you can see, I get really, really excited about using these examples. But Ann sent me this example and she said, look what I just got. And had received a Zara email campaign. Click on unsubscribe. Unsubscribe from the campaign only to then get a screen that said, and now you'll be receiving our newsletter unsubscription request email, and you've got to click on that to actually get removed from the list. You know what the next step that someone does when they get that is they click report as spam because you're just becoming annoying. You've got to make it easier for people to get out of your campaigns. Or this example, I challenge you to find the opt-out link. Oh, it's there. Oh, there it is. Right? We make it all too hard for people just to get out of our campaigns. I don't know why we do that. And probably the most recent example, which I'm calling the insert foot into mouth. mouth. If you did not see this trending on Twitter or on, the local, on your local or national news, um, Adidas, after the Boston Marathon uh, over the weekend, sent an email campaign to all the runners that completed the marathon. And the subject line was, congrats, you survived the Boston Marathon. That was sent and quickly became a trending news story, both online um, and on most of the cable news stations. We've got to make sure that we are taking our time and not sending out these types of mistakes. And the question is, is, is are we really trying that hard? Because more often than not, what we find is even when we self-report and ask marketers are actually doing something about this, and more often than not, they say, no, we're actually not using our tools at our disposal. And because of this, this is what we've caused, a psychological FOMO experience around the inbox because the actual reality, almost 90%, the majority of stuff that's coming in the inbox is really not that great. We just have a fear of missing that 10% opportunity where we can be delivering really unique experiences. And meanwhile, all the tech and laws have evolved around this particular industry. We've got things like spam folders that have then evolved into mark a spam and instantly unsubscribe. The email service, excuse me, the internet service providers like Gmail, Hotmail, Yahoo have started to layer on reputational data. So it used to be once you are authenticated, you could pretty much get into the inbox and then be delivered into different folders like junk and quarantine. But now they take your reputational data. They look at what subscribers do with your email campaigns and determine if that is going to get you into their inbox. This is much more different uh, sort of flow than we've had before. So we've got to understand that. They've also moved promotional emails out of the inbox, like with things with Gmail tabs. And Outlook is doing something really interesting where they're having a focused or an other area that's very similar to Gmail tabs, right? They deliver focused emails of emails that you actually care about versus other that those may be promotional or things that you don't care about. And we're seeing things like text coming back. So the Apple iWatch or wearables certainly provide an opportunity for connect with people in a different context, but they only render a very limited amount of HTML. And so we've got to get accustomed to utilizing our text-based campaigns again. Of course, Windows is, and, and Outlook has always been a huge issue for most marketers. And we thought it was going to get solved with Windows 10, but it didn't. Images still don't scale collect, co correctly. Excuse me. Uh, no CSS3 or HTML5 support. So basically, the backbone of the modern web is not supported. No support for divs. No support for media queries. So we can't do anything from a responsive perspective. Um, but the one thing we do know is that we've heard through the grapevine that Microsoft is planning on solving a lot of these issues over the next few years, so maybe this will get better finally. You've also seen the native apps evolve, right? So iOS 10 brought this ribbon that comes across the, the top that shows the ability for people to actually unsubscribe from your campaign right within the actual um, app, right within the operating system software versus actually having to use the tiny six-point font that we've put at the bottom of our campaigns. And we're starting to see native video come to iOS 10, which is the first, um, if you will, uh, uh, smartphone platform or, or uh, this first platform that allowed uh, within their actual native mail application for video to play right within it. So some cool things that are coming. And then across the globe, we've seen some changes when it comes from a legislation issue around the tech end as it relates to can spam. Particularly, here are sort of the countries that have different can spam apps. Um, and if you're doing any sending outside of the U.S., these slides are probably particularly important for you. I'll just touch on the one country that's had some of the most progressive and major changes around spam, and that's Canada. Our good friends up north, if you're sitting in the U.S., um, have rolled out what's called CASEL over the last few years. What CASEL is, is the Canadian anti-spam legislation laws. 
And what it does is it defines implied consent, meaning that you have the ability to email someone without their consent for the first time, versus express consent. And basically, if you don't fall into any of the specific things that require implied consent, then you and the vast majority of brands do fall into the express consent button, meaning you have to get express consent before you send even one email campaign. That's very different than can spam in the US. Technically, you're allowed to send one email to everyone that has an email address from in, in the US without getting consent. It's the second email that requires consent in the US. In Canada, you cannot do that. And if you think that Canadians are joking around about Castle, they're not. Uh, they're finding companies to the tunes of millions of dollars, not only the companies themselves, but corporate officers can be gone after to the tune of $10 million respectively a piece. So both the organization and the corporate officers can be fined in this regard. So just make sure if you are doing any sending in these countries, take the time to get to know the laws. The point of these last few slides is really to show you that we're doing a really, really bad job as, as email strategists and tacticians, and we're slowly losing that really valuable real estate in the inbox, right? The ability to have these opportunities for ROI is slowly going away. So how do we make email great again? This is where we get to the fun parts uh, and the last half uh, of the next hour or so. We start with authentication. We've got to make sure that we prove who we are. So you remember that slide that I showed you just a few ago. This is sort of how an email gets into the inbox. One of the most important components is that step two, sort of right in the middle of your screen right now. And that's where we get authenticated as a sender, where the mail server says brand A is who brand A says it is. And we do that in a variety of different ways, particularly for specific authentication protocols that I wanted to bring to your attention today. SPF, DKIM, sender ID, and DMARC. We're going to go through each one of these, and I'm going to show you what each one of these means. So SPF first is the sender policy framework. This is basically the gold standard of email authentication. What this allows you to do is essentially tell all of the internet service providers that I am who I am. You take an SPF record that you get from your email service provider. So the MailChimp, the Marketos, the responses of the world, they provide you with a record. That record you take over to your DNS with wherever you either host or maintain that DNS record, that could be GoDaddy or Namecheap or Google Domains, and you apply a text record on your DNS for any one of these particular authentication protocols. And that's as easy as it is, is just making sure that those two things are talking to each other. So that's SPF. The next one, the other text record is what's called Domain Keys Identified Mail, or DKIM. Again, this is similar to the, the showing the actual internet providers that you are who you are, this matches your DNS with your sender so that they know that the appropriate DNS is actually sending the appropriate records. Um, if it fails to match, then you have a failure on, on that DKIM record. The next one is sender ID. Not vitally important for Gmail, probably more important for AOL and, and, uh, and Hotmail Yahoo, um, but it's called sender ID, almost identical to S SPF with just a few key differences that you don't need to know, but it's particularly important if you have a high propensity of, uh, of non-Gmail related addresses. And the last one is a, a DMARC policy. You can only get a DMARC policy and record if you have an SPF and a DKIM, um, and that allows you to have that DMARC record that you can, you can apply to your DNS. So those are sort of the four core areas. Now, if you're looking for where you actually go and find this information, this is a screenshot of a MailChimp account. But basically, within any admin panel of your email service provider, you should be able to poke around and find either domain authentication or SPF record or DKIM record. And what the actual email service provider will do is give you the records that you need to go take back to your DNS host, whoever that, whomever that may be. So that's how you go about authenticating that domain. If you need any way to check it, there's a variety of different ways. The one that I do love to be able to check with is called Postmaster Tools, which is a relatively new tool that's available from Gmail. So for any of the SEO lovers in the room who are familiar with Webmaster Tools, this is like the Webmaster Tool, let's see, the Webmaster Tools of Gmail. It essentially provides senders with a really good understanding of how they're performing inside of Gmail. There's no other internet service provider that provides this information publicly for free. But Gmail has started to roll it out over the last few, last year or so. Um, and all you have to do is authenticate that you own your domain. And then you can get all these rich stats around how often are you getting delivered? Are there any deliver errors? Are you authenticated? Do you have your DKIM record, your DNS record, your SPF record? Um, but I would encourage you to just take a look at Postmaster Tools, get your domain authenticated, 
and take a look um, at those so that you can have a better idea of what that data provides you. So that's authentication. The next way to make an email awesome, again, is design. And this is this idea that ubiquity matters, right? We have to be able to give consumers an experience in their inbox regardless of wh whatever device that they're on. So how do we do that? We deliver designs that are single column or skinny based layouts because here's what's happened. Facebook and all of the social media networks and our devices have trained us that our thumb or our finger is the key to getting through content. So the way that we can make that easier in the inbox is to deliver content that allows people to get through it really easily utilizing either their thumb or that single finger, right? So good example here from Tommy John. You can flow through the email without having to um, pinch or zoom. Uh, GoTo sometimes gets a little jumpy, but this is a video animation that you should be seeing and it's scrolling through the Kennedy Center to write. I can get through all the events uh, at the Kennedy Center without having to pinch and zoom or buy tickets and click things. Uh, without having to utilize anything but my thumb or a single finger to get through uh, that content. Another good example here from Brick, you remember that pinch and zoom that I showed you earlier? This is the redesign of their email newsletter, so you're able to actually get through all the content with a single flick of your finger. Just a couple other examples that you can take there to utilize. We have to get used to being using really appropriate fonts and buttons. This example comes from Campaign Monitor. They published this. Uh, they published this particular uh, blog post a few years, about two, well, a few years ago, two ish, maybe eighteen months ago. Um, look at the content of the email campaign of their blog subscribers campaign. It says how we got 127 percent increase in click throughs by redesigning this blog subscribers email. There's only one difference between the two, and I'm sure you can spot it. It's the green button versus the blue hyperlinked normal text. By just including a button. That drove 127% more click-throughs from this campaign. So we've got to get used to utilizing appropriate fonts and buttons. What do those look like? These are not my best practices. These are best practices that are shared around the industry, but headlines should be 30 pixels minimum. That headline that you're seeing right there on your screen, how to write great email copy, that's 30 pixels. Feels big, but it, not, it isn't really that big, all things considering when you're looking at your device. Uh, rather than looking on your desktop. Body copy has got to be 16 pixels minimum. That allows someone to see that body copy when they're holding their phones at the average human arm length. The minimum text size you're going to want to go to is 13, largely because it, because it gets too small at that point for someone to not have to bring their phone closer to their eyes, and you're, giving, you're making them work to see that content. Also keep in mind that Apple will often re-render those text sizes that are too, below the 13 threshold into larger font sizes so that people can actually read them. So it could be breaking your design. Buttons have got to be a minimum of 44 by 44 points. That's about 150 by 150 pixels. Why that size? Because that's the average tappable area of a human finger. Apple has, no, this comes from Apple. This is, a, this is the data they've seen millions on millions, if not billions of interactions on phones. This is the size that allows the average thing, finger to touch on something. And then you want to make sure you've got at least, say, 15 to 20 pixels of white space around those buttons so we aren't causing multiple different calls to action to happen between buttons. I love this example from Starbucks. If you are a fan of uh, their recent new introduction drink, their, their toasted coconut cold brew, um, which is actually pretty delicious. I'm not a huge fan of coffee at Starbucks, but I'm a fan of their marketing efforts. And I loved this example. So take a look. I received this email campaign just a few, about a week and a half, two weeks ago, um, when they launched this product. On the left-hand side is the desktop version. You can see that the call to action, that button, is delicious details. I then looked at the email without even thinking about it in my phone. And the call to action is order now. So what they're doing is they know that someone's in a different, particularly in a different context that they're looking at their desktop. They probably want to, you know, check out what else is in this little coffee gloriousness that's going to be in my hand. But when they're on their phone, they maybe be on the go. Maybe they just want to order that right now, and you can tap them right into the Starbucks app. Those contextual opportunities that we have to serve different buttons, I think, become really re unique depending upon where someone is reading our email campaign. I thought that was genius by Starbucks. We've got to get to the point, right? If we know people are on the go, then leverage their beautiful screens to show them these images and get to the point, right? People want to know what you want them to figure out. Show it to them right off the top of the screen. Three really good examples here to look at from Brilliant. You can see their new product, their green bicycle. You can shop it from Lululemon getting ready to run in a flash sale from Handy. We've also got to let images do the talking. As I mentioned before, we've got these beautiful screens. Let's show off what those screens can show off around our brand assets, right? So if we can let the images do the talking for things around, then do that. People are accustomed to a pretty experience on the web. We like pretty things. So take advantage of utilizing all those great assets from a visual perspective that we're doing as brands 
inside of your campaigns. And for the love of all things holy, we've got to eliminate the words click here because people do not click with their fingers or their toes or whatever extremities they may be utilizing to touch their phones. We also know that generic calls to action usually result in decreased click-throughs comparatively to those that are specific. So watch the webinar, download the white paper, RSVP for your event, delicious details, order now. Those sorts of calls to action are much more specific and useful than click here. As I mentioned before, Tim just made text relevant. We've got to give our text-based campaigns a little love because of the opportunity to get into a wearable device. If you're looking for inspiration around this idea of ubiquity, um, and design around emails, there's this website called reallygoodemails.com. You're able to select different types of categories that give you the best of the best. It's a really great site to take a look at. Tools for understanding these from a better perspective, things like Litmus, Targeted.io, and Email on Acid will all give you some really good insights into what your emails look like throughout the inbox. Here's an example of Litmus showing you off, so you can actually put your HTML in, see how it renders, and then do this thing called Instant Previews, which shows off your email campaign inside of up to 140 different inboxes from Lotus Notes to the latest Apple iPhone. Subject lines, because they matter a lot. All the data that I'm going to show you in the next few slides comes from our friends at Phrasey. They are an app that allows you to provide, that gives you better recommendations for your subject lines that are, they say, 95% better than any human could actually predict. Um, they did a really good study about a year ago around words that elicited either both opens or conversions, and here's what they found. Apologies for the extra text, but this is the best way to lay this out. Superlatives matter a lot. Phrases like brand new, latest, and exciting gave open rate lips of 37, 24, and 19%. The perfect gift, which imperfectly depresses open rates by a negative 28%, or the most mediocre of adequate adjectives good, reduced open rates by a not so good 27%. So you've got a really determine which particular superlatives add value to your campaigns. Also, we've always thought that like the stalwart sales words like free or buy one, get one were keys to getting into the spam box, spam folder, excuse me. That's just not the case. We know that when we utilize those words like buy one, get one or free or use the word prices or worth or deal, all of those words contribute to higher open rates than we'd seen before around these words. Questions often make a difference. Questions that start with can't or won't did better and lifted open rates than those that started with will or who. So you've got to make sure you're utilizing context around those questions. If you're wondering what all the words that Phrasey looked at, we've actually baked in these charts. So you can just go to phrasey.com and take a look. But they had action-based words. They had sales-based words and had all this data around the impact that it had on open, click, and click to open rate or punctuation. They didn't look at emojis, but it's one of the hot topics right now in an email. Um, and we know that advertisers are just blowing up with emojis. But one of the things that came out of that Adobe study was um, understanding if people are using emojis in a white-collar workplace. And we know that they are. Almost 42% of white-collar workers have used an emoji in work emails, and 72% use them in their personal emails, things like the thumbs up, the really smiley face, the happy face, or whatever these differences are. I'm, I'm too old at this point to know the nuances between emojis, but these are the most popular ones that are being utilized. I would encourage you to take a look at some of the other data, sort of the top 15 emojis that are being utilized. This data came from MailChimp at the end of last year. If you're going to use emojis, use them in context. I love what Bands in Town does. So if, as they're doing posting a message, they use a little bullhorn. When things are on fire, like tickets, they're using the fire symbol, right? So if you use them in context, I think that's really important when you're utilizing that emoji so that it makes some contextual reference to the content in the email campaign. Interactivity. Let's have some fun inside the inbox. You know, gone are the days where we only have the ability to use text and JPEGs. We've got ability with the devices that we have and the types of inboxes, the applications that we have at our disposal that we're sending into where we can do things that are well beyond those, those sort of flat images and text and do things that are like GIFs and animations and real-time conversations. Um, Mark Robbins, who's an email developer at Rebel Mail, which is one of a superb shop that's out of Europe, was presenting about a year ago, and he said, IC Interactive is a huge shift in email development because early analytics have shown them that there's far greater engagement from users who receive these interactive messages. So what do they look like? Things like real-time or conversational data. This comes from Litmus. They actually baked in a real-time Twitter stream using a hashtag right into their email campaigns. This was the one that they did for this particular year. As you scroll down the campaign, wait for it, there's actually an interactive quiz right inside this campaign from Litmus. So you're able to take quiz questions 
and actually to see if they were right or wrong. What Litmus did to drive, in, to drive people to actually answer these questions is they gave away tickets um, to Litmus Live based on if you answered the questions. And they announced those winners in the panel just below these questions live. So they didn't have to go back and resend or communicate it. You just opened the email, closed it, reopened it. You got to see who was winning those tickets live and in a real-time way. We have the ability to use GIFs. These are three good examples here from uh, PetMeds, who's doing the countdown clock, to me in the middle, who's doing the Arrive collection, right, showing off the features using that GIF at the bottom. And then I love this example from Kitnace, which uses this push-pause campaign they did for the holidays, because it's very contextual, right? You're pushing pause, because that's their holiday campaign, but it also open. you know, you want to push that pause button, it opens to their actual campaign related to it. Here are two other uh, really good examples of gifts that I loved, Core Power Yoga rolling out the map for It's Your Birthday and that same Starbucks cold brew email showing off just a little ring around the lid, right? How do you create some of that interactivity when it comes to these campaigns? They work for B2B2. Here are two examples from Evernote and Asana showing off different feature sets that's available. Or you can do things like this. This is my friend Alexander Levy from Curata who baked in a gif of him dancing around at the last Marketo conference. Keep in mind that you can always have a fallback image. So I showed this example for Jack Spade, the one that's actually the GIF in the background that's moving is the GIF example, but you can have a fallback image. So just in case whatever device is that's rendering the email does not support GIFs, it can actually render just a flat image too. So where are we going with this? This is what Chad White calls mailable microsites. I think Nordstrom does a really interesting thing here where they actually have a full almost version of their website inside their campaign. So that if you're not interested in the sweaters that are being sold here, you can jump into other places. We can leverage things like pre-headers, so having that ability to have a second almost subject line, if you will, to give people an idea of what's in our email campaign. And we know that when people use uh, pre-headers, they typically have the same performance metrics and impacts that subjects line do. So the better the subject line, the more optimized it is, the right words that are utilized, the more often that we see open rate lists comparatively to when we're not using appropriate words and appropriate length inside of pre-headers. Then we get into data automation and triggers. So we know that this can be a, a huge area of, uh, of opportunity because segmentation allows us to drive so much more revenue. This data comes from our friends at Campaign Monitor. They saw a 760% increase in revenue comparatively across all their clients when utilizing segments of campaigns versus one size fits all. So what do we mean by that? We can do different from names, right? If we're a sales-based organization, let's use our account reps' names or salesperson's names versus our organization name. We can use first, first name personalization in, in subject lines, which have been known to increase open rates by 26%. You, know, you can use these both in content as well, or whether it's a text-based campaign too. Just some examples of that first name content. We can leverage dynamic content. So we can deliver a different image to different people depending upon different data sets that we may have. Maybe they're male or female or different locations that they may be in. Movable ink is the example that you're seeing right here. Data from the crowd, again, that example from Litmus that's showing that hashtag. Then we can do things like the welcome series, which is one of the most important series we're going to touch on in just a second. We can do onboarding, right, help people get to know our product like Slack does or any number of good startups. This is the onboarding process from Equinox. It's about 94 email messages over the course of about 150 days. It's a really great example of a welcome onboarding process. Or we can celebrate things based on anniversary dates and birthdays because we have those dates on our customers. So good example here from PetSmart or Core Power, as I mentioned before, showing off that yoga mat that rolled out for your birthday and giving you something for that. A good, a really simple example, if this, you think this is too hard, this is Gary Rieger, my ophthalmologist in Los Angeles, who manages to send an automatic campaign on my birthday too. Or we can do things like purchase intent. So you can see here with your Amazon Prime member or you put something in a cart recently, you've probably received a cart, what we call a cart abandonment email, where we put something in there or we've expressed some sort of behavioral interest in a product and we can get you know, that email campaign out that allows someone to hopefully come back and convert for us. Or utilize purchase history. I'll call your attention here to the shop, the button in the middle right there, where it says shop size large, rather than just shop now or shop you know, some generic size. This is able to just drop it right into someone's cart. And for a brand like Bonobos, that's important because they want their consumers to be able to check out as quickly as possible. Or we can do pre and post event things like showing off what people need to know before they get to the event, like parking or what they can expect or different activities. And then thanking them for coming after the event and showing them how they connect with us social or in different facets or you know, provide the next event that they could come to. Weather. 
Um, IBM obviously acquired weather.com's data set over the last year or so to the tune of about a half billion dollars. It's really important for marketers to be able to deliver dynamic based campaigns based on maybe what's happening from a seasonal perspective. I'm sitting in DC today, it's gonna be 80 degrees, but in St. Louis, I know it's gonna be like 50. Um, and if I'm gonna be delivering a t-shirt campaign to DC, I probably don't wanna be delivering that t-shirt campaign to St. Louis when it's 50 degrees and it's gonna require you to have a sweater on uh, tomorrow. So being able to do things like that. Or customer data, I love this example from Nest. They actually take and conglomerate all of your data from your battery to your smoke sensor to your thermostat and tell you inside of the email campaign that everything's up to date or if anything needs adjusting. And then they're able to cross sell you different opportunities. And we've got to take advantage of our transactional emails. So if you're an e-commerce provider or do anything from an e-commerce provider, I love this example from Manobos that I'm gonna show you in a quick second, but transactional emails really matter because they typically are read way more often than our campaigns almost eight times more often based on the data that we got from uh, Campaign Monitor at the end of last year. This example from Manobos, you'll note that I've got a little arrow that shows you, and it says, while you wait, enjoy a cat who loves boxes. And I would encourage you to go take a look at this video. I can't show you now, it'll be too hard to run through, but it's Manu, the cat who just jumps into boxes on YouTube. This cat's got like, I don't know, a billion views on YouTube at this point. He just jumps in boxes. Now this has nothing to do with Manobos, but you better believe that I'm gonna look for these Easter eggs every time a Bonobos email comes in. And I think that's important because if we are utilizing those transactional emails to do something interesting, it could impact when we send promotional emails because people are gonna to wanna to look for that fun content that we're sending. Or, you know, if Manu is your ear speed, Bonobos then sends you this week a ability to buy a mini pony if you would like to go do that. And if you think gathering data is hard, I really like this example for minimum fashion. Um, you know, we're all doing these overlays or pop-ups, if you will, um, around gathering subscribers. And I love what they did here. They asked for name, email, and then male or female instead of just simply confirm so that they can get an additional data point. Also, always say hello, because it's the most important campaign that you're gonna send in order to make email great again. And reason why is this. Four times higher open rates, five times higher click-through rates, 33% increase in long-term engagement. The stats speak for themselves. Welcome campaigns are almost always the most read campaign that you're gonna send as an email marketer. But often we find that companies aren't taking advantage of them. Almost 40% of companies say that we don't, they don't have a welcome series. And often the question is, okay, well, how do we send those? Are they real-time or are they batched? And we know when companies send a real-time email right away, when someone subscribes, that they have tremendous impacts on transaction rates or just engagement related to those campaigns. I'm not gonna give you particulars around this welcome series because we're getting close to the end of our hour together, but I've included tons of examples of different opportunities that you can do from welcome series, from the hello, to help them get started with your organization, to telling people how to take the next step, to showing people how to do business with you. There's a lot of great examples for this. Um, the one thing that I'll show, share with you is that a lot of companies use offers in their email campaigns, and I think that's great. I think there's a strategy behind leveraging offers, but be very careful because you're tuning people to think that they're going to get an offer each and every time that you send your campaign. This example from Airtable I would have you take a look at, but it's a, just a superb example of a welcome series. So this is the first email campaign that you get. Helps people get started with their particular product. Um, you can watch different videos, and then about a day later, you actually get case studies on the ways that brands are leveraging Airtable. So from PBS to WeWork to all these different places that are utilizing Airtable. And then a couple of days later, you get how do teams collaborate around our platform series. So they're doing a really good job of just showing off all the benefits of their particular product. Here are some tools for personalization and automation that you can leverage from a data perspective. The last tip I have for you is to be human because we've got to get real inside of our inboxes. So what does that look like? Speak like a human, we know people are on the go and they're expecting to have a one-to-one -one communication experience inside their inboxes. Take the marketing and copywriter speak out of the equation and speak like people are spoken to in a day-to-day -day basis. There's some really good examples of this from both a B2B and a B2C perspective that you can take a look at in this deck at a later date. Allow people to tell you what they wanna receive. If they're gonna opt in for your campaigns and you've got multiple different types of newsletters or content, allow people to self-select what they'd like to actually select. In that same vein, ask people when they want to actually receive it. So Bonobos does a really good job. If you click on their subscription center, they actually will change your frequency. Uh, you can actually change your frequency preferences before simply unsubscribing. Give people reasons to say hello, do something different. This came from a startup out of Silicon Valley that had contacted our agency four times. On the fifth email, he said, I'm so sad, I'm sending you a picture of Dawson's crying because I'm that sad. 
and I had to call this guy because this was just too good, but give people reasons to actually give you a call. And if they aren't engaged, get them engaged again with some sort of, of re-engagement flow. So we've actually baked in a re-engagement flow here. But give them something different so that they will open or click so that you can know that they're still interested in your brand. And if people want out, make it very easy to get out. Don't bury your unsubscribe link. Because here's what happens. If you take people out that are uninterested in your brand and you still have people that are, your open rates, your metrics will go in the directions that you want them to go. I love this example of giving people reasons to stay. This comes from uh, Groupon. As you know, Groupon built their backs on the daily Groupon email. When you unsubscribe, this is what you got. You're unsubscribed. We're sorry to see you go. How sorry? Well, we want to introduce you to Derek. Derek's the guy who thought you'd enjoy receiving the daily Groupon email and you're presented with this video, which is Derek's email, Derek's coworker throwing scolding hot water all over him. As Derek's friend walks away, you see this call to action. You know, do you feel that was pretty mean? If you're happy, would you like to resubscribe? People resubscribed 47% of the time when they saw this video. So do something a bit different. And just get rid of purchase lists. Please get rid of those purchase lists because all the metrics that we care about from opens to clicks to unsubscribes to complaints all go in the wrong direction. This data comes from uh, MailChimp. So let's recap. How do we make email great again? First, you've got to get authenticated so you can prove who you are. Make sure you're designing for being ubiquitous throughout, regardless of whether which type of device or platform that users are on. Get better at your subject lines. I'm not talking length because we know based on evidence that length has nothing to do with it. Use the right words. Use the right triggers to make sure trigger words to make sure you're front loading those messages appropriately. Interactivity. Get jazzy. Utilize things like GIFs or different animations or real-time content to make those emails more interesting. Take the time to work in automation and triggers because personalization rapid, personalization matters so much these days so that you're giving a unique targeted experience with inside of that inbox. Always say hello because it's polite and it is the campaign that always works and people interact with. And be human, right? We have to start talking normally because this is an inbox experience, not a marketing experience that people want to have. But why make email great again? I'm just going to give you three reasons that you can go away with today. Number one, engagement matters. We heard from the experience, Email Experience Council some really interesting things about two years ago when they last met. They don't look at clicks and, and opens as a form of engagement. Excuse me, they don't measure clicks as a form of engagement at all. They measure things like what you're seeing here, opens. They look at replies. They're looking at moves, both to junk and folders. They're looking at deletes without open, and they're looking to move to folder. They're looking at a variety of different me metrics that we're not looking at at all. So engagement is measured at that subscriber level and based on metrics that we aren't tracking. I'm really sorry, I'm gonna pause and just turn off my Roomba, but it's turned on and it is very loud. Apologies on that. Number two, the future matters. If we care about this channel and delivering really good ROI for our brands, then where does this idea of the mailable microsite go from here? If this is where we're trending towards, you know, there are opportunities that are happening out there like the project uh, beta that's coming out of, a Google project that's coming out of, um, a project that's coming out of Google where utilities can actually, consumers can actually pay their utility bills right within Gmail. What happens when Gmail actually rolls that out across the entire ecosystem for brands to take advantage of? If we have screwed up our emails past, we're not going to be able to take advantage of this opportunity uh, from Gmail or anybody else. If you look at how Apple and iOS is integrating Wallet deeper and deeper into the iOS experience, it's not going to be long before I'm going to be able to click on something that's happening inside of my Apple mailbox and deliver it right without having to ever go to a website and pay for it right through it, my, app, my wallet that's right installed on my phone. So if we've, not, if we've messed up this experience already, we're not going to be taking advantage of what future holds in this area. And number three, and I hearken back to that, exa that example where we talked about what happens, what's been happening from a media perspective, is that familiarity rules. This is my mom on New Year's with me. We were toasting at midnight with a bottle of champagne. This is a woman, 60 years plus, that calls me all the time about, how do I do this on Facebook? How do I do this on Twitter? What's Instagram? A week ago, she called me and asked what's Snapchat, and I just politely put down the phone because I wasn't going to answer that question. But you know what she never calls me about? She never calls me about her inbox because the inbox is the one digital place that we understand and we kind of know how to control, or at least we think that we know how to control. We've been around this platform, we've been around the inbox for so long, we just get it. And it doesn't fundamentally change all that often. And because we're getting bombarded by Facebook, Twitter, and the like, this is an area where we're starting to see people go back to because they know how to control this experience. It's in an area where they're just simply addicted to. So that's three reasons on why 
you spent the last sort of hour and five minutes with me. If you have questions and comments, I would love to answer them now. If we've got a few extra times, Zach, if people want to stick around. Or you please feel free to reach out if you've got questions, comments, concerns, or would like to have a conversation. I'm at Michael J. Barber pretty much everywhere online, and that's my personal email address. But if you do, send me an email. Just give me a day or two to reply, uh, because much like you all that are getting you know hundreds of emails, I'm getting those too a day. But thank you for taking the time to spend the last 65 or so minutes with me. Wow, thank you, Michael. That was great. Uh, I, I do want to take a second to pat myself on the back that I knew that was a Roomba when I heard that sound. So I know. Uh. Yeah, I was like, oh no, <laughs> the Roomba is starting. <laughs> um, so uh, I just want to remind everyone we will be sending out this recording and Michael's slides tomorrow morning, and they'll be on our website as well. But uh, let's jump into the questions really fast since we don't have much time. Uh, one question I did get. Uh, you kind of ran through the tools, email tools, uh, quickly. You mentioned Postmaster and reallygoodemail.com. Uh, do you kind of want to go over again uh, the tools really fast just to kind of recap that? Yeah, absolutely. So um, Postmaster tools is where you can get deliverability and really good insights on your Gmail subscribers that you're delivering to. Um, and you can also go to a company like Return Path if you have a big enough budget to understand where you're getting delivered as well. Um, from a design perspective, Litmus. Targeted.io and email on acid are really good places. Um, I showed a huge slide of, around tools and personalization and automation that had a ton of different opportunities. There are all the ones that we know about, HubSpot, um, Marketo, Eloqua, Campaign Monitor, MailChimp. Those are all well known and those are why I don't put those particular logos up. But a couple of really sort of challenger brands that are out there that I think are really interesting Vero is a really great brand that's a, a platform that's out of Australia, particularly good for e-commerce brands. Um, uh, Autopilot, which is another brand out of uh, Australia, but is making huge inroads here in the U.S. It's a super easy user interface. So if you're a non-technical marketing geek um, and you don't have those those real robust automation skills and, and don't can't take the time to learn a Marketo or, or so on and so forth, Autopilot's a really good, easy way um, to learn those types of things. Um, and then there's a variety of different slides after pretty much every section that have other tools that you can go take a look at as well. Okay, that's great. Uh, and then uh, let's do one last question since we are over time. Uh, what is yep. the one prediction uh, you have for email uh, next year? Well, I think I touched on it. I think you're going to see deeper integration from a commerce perspective because at the end of the day, what Google, Amazon, iOS, and all these major technological platforms want is, is, is access to our wallet and our spending power. And I, so I think you're going to see more integrations from the inbox into the ability to spend dollars um, than you will have I've seen uh, you know, since we really started having email for consumers back in, like say, 95, 94, 95, when Hotmail came out. I think the other big prediction um, will be around uh, you know, making sure that we have all this rich content opportunities like video and more interactivity. Those, those sorts of features will start to roll out on platforms that may be older legacy-based platforms like Outlook and things of that nature um, because that's what people are gravitating towards these days. Um, and our attention spans are so short, we want the ability to deliver those types of content opportunities in the inbox as well. Okay. Um, that was a, a great webinar, uh, especially for me. I'm, I'm learning email as, as I go through the, you know, in my career, and, and this was a bit really informative uh, for me to kind of learn, you know, where it's going and, and how valuable it really is. Uh, but I do want to thank everyone for joining. Uh, you know, vertical measures for this webinar. Uh, and I do want to remind everyone that we will have another webinar next month with Chris Sietzema on May 11th. So mark your calendars and, and we'll send all the information out. So thank you again, Michael Barber. And uh, I will see you guys next month. Thanks, Zach.